The last 11 verses of Hebrews 11 comprise one of the most amazing rhetorical masterpieces of human history. The preacher of this sermon, whether it be Paul or Apollos or someone else, we don't really know, brings this whole theme of faith to a conclusion in a way that literally boggles the mind. He eloquently delineates the valiant, valiant exploits of the faithful, both in victory and in defeat. One author said, in all of scripture, there can be found no other passage more inspiring than this. And this catalog of faith not only includes those who won great victories through faith, but also those who suffered persecution and even martyrdom through faith. And one of the reasons why this section is so rhetorically powerful is the way it is uniquely structured. O'Brien points out that up to this point, certain individuals have been introduced by the anaphoric by faith. Now this changes to a rapid fire series of names and accomplishments. And yes, there are some names mentioned in this section, but they are given in a rapid fire fashion that creates a kind of staccato effect. O'Brien writes the single accomplishments cited in verses 32 to 35a are set out in clauses of similar length and structure called an isocolon, which according to Cosby, create a rhythmic barrage which gives the impression that great numbers of people crowd into the author's mind as he speaks. He keeps saying things like, what more shall I say? Or time will not permit me to mention all these others. And the implication is that this list could include countless others who have also demonstrated biblical faith. O'Brien says this whole section would have engaged his listeners, prompting them to immediately recall the stories to which the author alludes. And since some of the accomplishments might be associated with more than one person, for those familiar with Israel's tradition, the text evokes associations with an ever-widening circle of faithful people. In other words, the story of God's people is the story of faith. <clears throat> but there is one common element with all these people, and that is the element of genuine faith. And we have seen faith demonstrated in a lot of different ways in this chapter, but in this final section, we see it demonstrated through courage. And when you think about it, courage may be the supreme mark of faith. The courage of faith is needed when the odds are against you. It is needed when obeying God makes no logical sense. It is needed in the midst of persecution. It is certainly needed in the face of dying for the sake of the gospel. The truth of the matter is, it's not that difficult <coughs> to believe God when everything is going well. It's fairly easy to believe God when you're in the midst of other believers and when your faith costs very little. <coughs> Excuse me. But genuine faith is proved to be real in the midst of suffering and persecution and opposition. It is at these times the courage of faith is especially needed. And we see that clearly illustrated in our present passage of Scripture. Now, I'm going to tell you up front that we're not going to get through this entire passage of Scripture. You knew that. 
But this long passage really divides naturally into three main sections. The first one takes the most attention, and so we're going to be doing well if we get through the first main point today. But before we even look at the first main point, I want to return for a moment to the issue of structure. I want you to understand up front how this passage is organized. (coughs) We're going to see three things. We're going to see courage in the midst of struggle. We're going to see courage in the midst of suffering. And we're going to see confidence in the promise of salvation. So those are our three main points. But it is important for us to see that there is a clear distinction between the courage of those in the first category and the courage of those in the second category. Verses 30 through 35a refer to what you might call triumphant heroes. These are those who (coughs) won great victories through faith. In these verses, you see words like conquering, subduing, quenching. And the victories here vary in nature, but they're summarized with the climactic statement at the beginning of verse 35, women received back their dead by resurrection. Now, the health and wealth prosperity preachers would love this part because it's all about winning great victories. But they wouldn't be real excited about the second part because that part deals with those who suffered and even died in faith. Verses 35b through 38 speak of suffering heroes. This doesn't fit well with some people's theology, but it is a compelling truth of Scripture. There is a clear shift in verse 35 from those who triumphed through faith to those who suffered and died by faith. Another way to see this is by understanding the contrast between those who received their dead back through resurrection and those who suffer death in the hope and assurance of resurrection. Some escaped the edge of the sword, as verse 34 says. Others were killed by the sword, as verse 37 says. So with that in mind, let's move now into this first main point, which is courage in the midst of struggle. The author of Hebrews moves from the time of Moses to the period of history when the Israelites are ready to capture the promised land. Not surprisingly, he skips over the 40 years of wilderness wanderings because he has already told us this was a period of faithlessness. We don't find any examples of faith from that generation, (coughs) even though they saw firsthand the mighty plagues of Egypt and the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. Instead, they exhibited unbelief and constantly grumbled and complained. So God let them all die in the wilderness. But the author of Hebrews (coughs) finds some key examples of faith in that second generation And he points to two of them in verses 30 and 31. The first one he points to is what we might call the faith of the obedient. Look with me at verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, what is it that is emphasized here about the city of Jericho? It's walls. They were massive. Some city walls of this period were so large, you could drive two chariots side by side on the top of it. And there's no doubt that this was the case 
with Jericho. MacArthur says, Jericho was a frontier fortress city located strategically near the mouth of the Jordan River, and its walls were designed to protect it from the strongest enemy attack. And by the standards of that day, it was virtually impregnable. After wandering aimlessly in the wilderness for 40 years, the second generation of Israelites had now miraculously crossed the Jordan River in much the same way that they had crossed the Red Sea 40 years earlier. What should have taken them less than 40 weeks had taken them more than 40 years because of their unbelief. But now God is moving them into the actual possession of the land. There was much optimism and much excitement, but there, blocking their way into the promised land, was this fortified city of Jericho. It had to be defeated if they were going to enter the land of promise. In fact, Jericho was the largest city in Canaan, and there was no way the land <coughs> could be taken without first taking this stronghold. But what an enormous obstacle it was. From a human perspective, this was an impossible task for a ragtag multitude of ex-slaves who had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Not only were they no match for this impregnable fortress, they were no match for the city's well-trained and well-equipped army. And you may remember the negative report that had been brought back by the spies that Moses had sent into the land. It was somewhat exaggerated, but basically correct. The report had indicated the people are bigger and taller than we are, and the cities are large and fortified to heaven. The way the walls looked to them, it was like they were fortified to heaven. Of course, Moses had rebuked them, not because of the inaccuracy of the report, but because they did not believe that God could overcome odds like this. And he had said to them, do not be shocked nor fear them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf. The real obstacle was not Jericho or the walls, but their ability to believe God. The walls of the city were no problem at all to an omnipotent God. But the only unanswered question was, would his people go with him? Now, God's plan for Jericho was different from what anyone might expect. Later, the armies of Israel would be used to conquer the land. But God's plan for Jericho was for the people to do nothing but a symbolic act. And not only did the Canaanites need to know how powerful God was, but his own people did as well. And I'm sure you know the story. All that the people of Israel had to do was to walk around the city uh, once a day for six days with seven priests out in front carrying ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant. And the instructions from Joshua were that the people were to remain absolutely quiet as they marched around the city. And you can just see that eerie scene. They were to say nothing. They did this for six days and nothing happened. The seventh day, they were to march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their horns. And when the priests finally made one last loud blast. The people were to shout and the walls of the city would fall down flat. On this seventh day, the silence was broken. And of course, you know the outcome. The people obeyed the Lord and the walls fell down just as promised. 
And when the people shouted, the walls collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and took the city. That's Joshua 6.20. This victory was obviously God-given. But the Israelites had to fully trust God and obey him in all of this. Militarily, the seven days of marching demanded nothing from army, uh, Israel's armies. But psychologically, it demanded a lot of courage. How foolish this must have seemed to them, both the Israelites and the residents of Jericho. I mean, think about it. Grown men marching around this strong fortress for seven days with nothing but ram's horns. No doubt God's commands did not make any sense. This wasn't logical. The entire effort seemed totally preposterous. And that was the challenge for their faith. They had to trust God when what he commanded did not make any sense. You know, sometimes it is easier to fight than to trust God to fight for you. MacArthur says, if we fight, we will at least have a certain respect from the world, even if we lose. But faith always looks foolish in the eyes of the world. Trusting God to fight for us requires more faith. But the Israelites trusted God here. And one of the most interesting things about the account of this event in Joshua 6 is that there was not a single word of doubt or complaint registered. The people did it exactly as God commanded. For a full week, they marched around the city as God directed. And really, we would have to say this is a great milestone of faith for the people of Israel. It is clear from this account that God wanted them to know that they had absolutely nothing to do with this victory. He wanted them to know without any doubt that it was God who did this. And this is, a, this is still a lesson that God wants his people to learn today. And we know that the New Testament says that God exalts the humble but resists the proud. We see that in James 4, 6. Still today, the Lord desires to strip away our sense of self-sufficiency and bring us to the place where we acknowledge our total dependence on him. God is still teaching his people that lesson. This account, this account here is a great illustration of that. And by commanding the people to simply walk around the city without even carrying any weapons, made it clear that the battle belonged to the Lord. And it was obvious to all that the part the people played was only a symbolic act. When this victory came, when this victory came they could take no credit for it. And in the same way today, in a spiritual sense, we as Christians acknowledge that our salvation is all of God and our daily victories come from him as well. This is the life of faith. As we obey God, he gives us the victory. So we see the faith of the obedient, but secondly here, we see the faith of the outcast. Look with me at verse 31. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. This is really one of the most amazing statements in all of Scripture. Rahab was not a very likely candidate for the hall of faith. Apart from Sarah, she is the only woman to appear in this list. Not only that, but she was a prostitute. Someone has said she went from a house of shame to the hall of fame. 
Every time her name is mentioned in scripture, the moniker prostitute is attached to it. She no doubt had plied her trade there in the city of Jericho. She was well known for that. And by the way, Rahab is such a startling example of the grace of God that some have tried to minimize her role as a prostitute. Some have pointed out that the word that is used for prostitute in the Hebrew can also mean innkeeper. So there are some who have said that she wasn't really a prostitute. However, even though the Hebrew word can mean innkeeper, the word that is used in the Septuagint, the Greek, which was the version that the author of Hebrews quoted from, clearly reads prostitute. And other references to her in the New Testament make it clear that she was not just an innkeeper. For example, the Greek word that's used in James 2.25 clearly means harlot. And I believe it is important for us to understand exactly what she was before God saved her because this is intended by God to be an illustration of the power of God's saving grace. But there's something else we need to know about her. In addition to being a prostitute, she was also a pagan Gentile who worshiped a false god. In all likelihood, she was a priestess or prophetess in a pagan religion that deified sexual desires. She no doubt did not have a conscious awareness of sin as we do. She was completely pagan. She was not under the covenant. She was not familiar with God's law. She did not have any of the benefits of knowing the mandates of God. As James Draper wrote, she did not have the benefit of being a part of the nation of Israel with its long history of special relationship with God. Not only was she a Canaanite, but in fact, she was an Amorite, a race that God had long marked out for destruction. She is an amazing example of God's grace. Joshua 2, verses 1 through 21, record the thrilling story of her conversion. Joshua 2, 9 through 11, records her profession of faith. And the last part of verse 11 records her confession. For the Lord God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath, she said. Her faith was based on God's mighty acts. She had no special revelation from God, but her faith was <clears throat> based on the general revelation of what she observed. And her conclusion that Yahweh was the true God was based on the fact that he had led his people through the Red Sea on dry ground and had killed all the Egyptian armies. In Joshua 2, 9 and 10, we read, she said to the men, the spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og whom you utterly destroyed. Remember now, she was an Amorite herself, so surely this would have made a great impression on her. These were her own people. But by God's grace, she had come to the conclusion that the God of Israel was the one true God. And it's interesting when you think about it, Rahab had no more light than anyone else in Jericho 
But she believed while the others disbelieved. The other residents of Jericho also knew about the mighty things God had done, but they did not believe as she did. In fact, according to this verse, they not only did not believe, they were disobedient. This implies that they also knew that the true God was the God of Israel, but they rejected him. Is it possible that he issued some sort of response from them that is not recorded for us in Scripture? Had they heard a call from God that they had rejected? Well, we can't say for sure. But the bottom line is only Rahab believed and was saved. The others in Jericho wanted to kill the spies, but she welcomed them in peace. And for this, which was an act of her faith, she and her family were spared when God gave the city into the hands of God's people. On the other hand, because of their disbelief and their disobedience, all the others in the city were destroyed. Now, some people struggle with this whole idea of the destruction of a city like this, but this was how God judged people in the days of the Old Covenant. The Canaanites were a debauched, idolatrous, wicked people. They were known for their gross immorality, their perverted sexual practices, and their vicious cruelty. They sacrificed their own children to pagan gods. They even put babies in jars and built them into the foundation of their cities. So the destruction of this city was part of the judgment of God on these sinful people. Amazingly, though, in the midst of all this pagan unbelief and despicable wickedness was one who believed in the true and living God. As primitive as her faith was, she did believe. And by welcoming the spies that Joshua sent there, she risked her own life on the fact that God said he would protect his own people and she wanted to be on their side. She didn't understand it all, but she knew that these men who came to her house were messengers of the one true God, and she wanted to side with them. And even though in a sense, it meant turning her back on her own people, she chose to believe in the one true God. One author wrote, at a time when it seemed that those nomads outside the city did not have a ghost of a chance in taking Jericho, she believed God. She demonstrated a courageous faith, and as a result, she was not only spared, but she became part of the people of God. She became an Israelite. In Joshua 6.25, we read, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared, and she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. She became a permanent part of the people of God. Oh, but there's more. Not only was she named among the people of God, she was also honored greatly as well. Ron Phillips writes, Rahab was saved physically, morally, and spiritually. The New Testament, he says, places three crowns on her head. Hebrews 11.31 crowns her for her faith. James 2.15 crowns her for her fidelity. Matthew 1.5 crowns her for her new family because Rahab married Salmon, who became the great-grandfather of David 
and an ancestor of Jesus Christ. She became the mother of Boaz who married Ruth, the great grandmother of David. And that is how she became part of the messianic line of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, folks, if God can do something like this with an unlikely candidate like Rahab, he can save any sinner today. The saving grace that was extended to Rahab is still available to sinners today. And by the way, before we move on from Rahab, there are some other interesting things to note about this account, and I can't resist, so I'm going to give them to you, whether you want them or not. You have to go back to Joshua 2 to get the details, but I think there are a few other things that we should take note of. First of all, there is a question that I have always wondered about as to how the spies knew they could trust Rahab. How did they know she was among God's elect? How did they know she would protect them instead of turning them in? Have you ever thought about that? Now, the Bible doesn't answer that question, but there must have been some way for these two men to know that this was a place where they would be protected. Otherwise, why would they have gone to her house on the city wall? I don't believe it is right for us to assume that they were looking for a prostitute, but that God had given them some sort of information that this was one he was going to save. Secondly, we see that this salvation is extended to her whole household. This is similar to what we see in the book of Acts, where the salvation that came to the Gentiles involved the entire household. Of course, the spies gave them very clear instructions in Joshua chapter 2 that they must be in Rahab's house when the city fell or they would not be spared. It was only those who were in the house that were going to be spared. And if you can imagine when the city walls fell, all everything fell except this one little section where Rahab's house was. If they were out on the streets, they would not have any guarantee of being saved. But this was a clear indication that God's grace often extends to families and not just individuals. This points to the truth that many times when one family member becomes a believer in Christ, that others in the family also follow suit. Thirdly, we read in Joshua 2 that the spies told her that she would be released from the obligation of the promise and they would be released from the obligation of the promise to spare her and her family if she failed to tie the scarlet cord to the window. Now, this was the same cord by which the spies had climbed out of the city. But Christians for centuries have read significance into that scarlet cord as a symbol of the blood of Christ to save sinners. In fact, there are those who have traced this scarlet thread throughout the Bible because this is such a powerful symbol of the saving grace of God. Now, I think we'd better stop here for today. But what is the message that we have seen so far in this passage? Certainly, we see from the salvation of Rahab that there is no one too sinful 
and too despicable for God to save. If there is repentance and genuine faith in the heart of the one who is confronted with the truth of God's person and plan, there is salvation and deliverance from him. And Rahab is a dramatic picture of the miracle of God's saving grace. God accepted a woman who was deeply involved in sin and paganism. And because she believed God and trusted in him, God took her out of that pagan setting and out of her life of sin and made her a part of God's own people. And you too can experience that same kind of grace today. This account tells us that no matter how deeply we have gone into sin or how far away from God we have moved or how stained we have become, God's grace can still save sinners like us. It's all through the scarlet cord of the blood of Christ. That is the symbol of our salvation. Have you experienced that today? Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning that we would learn from these two examples of faith, or that uh, we also should be people of faith, that we should be people who practice courage in the face of um, what seems to be impossible at times, great obstacles that you, because you are omnipotent, can bring down. And Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace toward us. We thank you that just like Rahab, that we can be saved from a life of sin and depravity, that you, by your grace, take us out of that setting and unite us with the people of God and change our lives and make us those who are the recipients of your salvation, not just for this life, but for all eternity. And Lord, we pray if there's anyone here today that does not know that assurance of salvation today, they would come to know you. And Lord, that you would challenge all of us to be people of faith for your purpose and for your glory in this world. So Lord, we ask that you would now help us as we respond to you and your word, that we would uh, do so in a way that pleases and honors you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we'll have some elders here at the front as we conclude our service today. And if you need to receive Christ today, I uh, encourage you to come and talk to one of these guys. If you need to respond in some other way today, uh, then you come and do that as well. They'll help you with whatever you know your need might be. Uh, it might be prayer, it might be a word of counsel or whatever. Uh, you can come and talk to them. If you need to make some kind of public decision, uh, unite with the church, you can do that today as well. Well, I'm grateful for those of you who have braved the weather and come out today. And uh, I know it's always uh, a joy to be together when we can be together as the family of God. And we get a lot of benefit from that. So I'm glad that you chose to do that today. But we won't have evening services, so stay home, stay safe, and be with your family tonight. Let's stand together, and uh, Tim is going to come.